Good evening, y'all. Uh, before I can want to go in and talk about what is on my heart right now, I want to share a passage from you that was in my devotion today. And uh, it's in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 1 through 10. And it reads, in regards to temptations to sin, and he said to his disciples, Temptation to sin, temptations to sin are to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. And it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times, saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Increase our faith is the part of this next session. Section. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. In regards to unworthy servants, will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come, in from the field. Come at once and recline at table. Will he not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me, and dress properly, and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants, and we have only done what was our duty. So, as today was just very emotional. And that's typical whenever you go to a Pentecostal church. The uh, services tend to be unpredictable, tend to be emotional, and they tend to be very intimate. And that's why I identify as a Pentecostal Christian. I believe that God desires a relationship with us. And that he does so. He does so through spontaneous worship. And some people consider worship singing. Some people consider it shouting out, bellowing out. While other people just consider just praising the hand worship. You can worship in many different ways. Don't let somebody else define what worship should be and what it should look like. For every person, worship is a little bit different. And sometimes worship makes us cry. And recently, uh, the youth pastor that I work with Amazing man of God, I love him. I mean, this kid is younger than me by six years, and he encourages me to be a better better person and a better youth leader. And that's what I really like about Curtis. Even though I'm older, I look up to him. I mean, he's a good guy, good man of God brother and one of the things that he told me to do is he wanted me to take a season off and get recharged so to speak it's funny that he he would say that to refuel because recharge is the name of our ministry for youth i'm a youth leader down there i say down there because our youth ministry room is literally downstairs in the church and that youth ministry means a lot to me. 
even though it had a different name several years ago, it means a lot to me. Because it was there in the youth room that I was saved. I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I was saved by the grace of God. So I feel, even though I shouldn't, I feel like a part of me owes God. Again, His grace is a free gift that He offers. Salvation is a free gift. But just to say thank you for all that God's ever done for me, I feel like this is something I need to do for Him in return. Because I remember my youth leaders. I remember Pastor Jordan being the youth pastor at the time. I remember his wife, uh, Lindsay, being just like an active model for the ladies in the room. And when Pastor Jeremy was still there, it was him and his wife, Nicole. They were just amazing people that led. And then they had like other youth leaders. Like I remember Brandon. I remember... Who else was there? Melissa. I remember Brad and his wife. I don't remember Brad's wife's name, but I remember Brad being this like BA dude. This dude had tattoos galore. He was just a cool dude. Remember him? Uh, and then some other people who had come and gone. They were part of the uh, Masters Commission's team there. After they showed up that one time, they decided to be active role models. And I never really understood what it meant to be a youth leader until I kind of stepped into that role. The first time I ever tried to be a youth leader would have been in Marshalltown when I went to a, an evangelical church called Restore. I loved Restore. I loved the people there. It was small. It was intimate. Leadership was strong. And just the people there... They didn't judge you, and it certainly felt like they loved you. Well, I tried to be a youth leader in that setting. In that setting, you had literally 75% of the kids that attended were PKs, also known as pastor's kids. And if you know anything about pastor's kids, they tend... Not all, but they tend to be rebellious. They tend to not listen very well. And it could just be the hormones or whatnot. I don't like to single out just pastor's kids. But a lot of them, a lot of kids, just don't want to listen. They don't want to obey. They don't... It seems like they don't care. They don't want to respect. And that's probably why my heart is with them so much. Is because I remember being a kid. I remember not really caring about what other people thought. Like having no filter. Which I still have no filter. But like I remember that. The one thing that I really wanted. Were for people to listen. People to know me. People to love me. People to support me. Not saying that people didn't do that. But I wanted that in a Christian city. So oftentimes, even in a secular setting, I would grow attached to people. And so, rather than talk about that, I'm going to go back to that, what I was talking about, then we'll kind of talk about why I left that church. But it was just really hard for me to deal with kids and their behaviors. Uh, the reason why is because I used to work with kids with behaviors. And I'm not very good at de-escalating them or telling them what to do. I'm just not good with conflict. That's something that I need to work on and that's why I'm going to counseling. To work on that. To deal with certain things in a calm but rational manner. So that didn't last long because I didn't like conflict and I was still having a drinking problem. I would much rather spend my days off, which were Sundays at that time, drinking with my friends. So part of what 
made me leave that church is due to the lead pastor who had started the church with a bunch of his friends. Like, I love the guy. Still, brother, I forgive him. He was in a bad spot in life, and he made a bad choice. I mean, you could sugarcoat it any way that you want it, but you know what? It all comes down to this. We're all sinners in need of a savior, and we can't judge people based upon their choices. Because we're no better than the, we're no better than him, and he's no better than us. As far as I'm concerned, we're all on the same plateau. So people could dog on him, people could hate on him, people could say all these mean things about him. But unless you truly get to know the guy, you see something different. And if you're truly a Christian, if you're truly saved, then you understand why you had to feel that way. So I left that church, and I decided to go back to the church I was saved at as a kid. Ended up moving back home to Des Moines, which is what I guess the youth pastor here wanted. Uh, there's definitely a calling on my life to be a youth pastor or college campus ministry director. And I see that when I work with these kids. Because I remember a conversation I had with my youth pastor way back in 2015. Might have been 2014, 2015. But at Jordan, when he was working in Marion. So, interesting about Pastor Jordan. He was working as a pastor, obviously, for a small church. can't remember the name of the church. If I remember it, I'll let you know. He was working for that, and then he was doing part-time for, like, graphic design at the University of Iowa Pomerantz Career Center. And I remember him telling me, because at that time, I was struggling. Struggling with what God wanted me to do in my life. And one thing that Jordan encouraged me to do is do what makes you feel, or do what helps you come alive. Like, and like what made me come alive working with you? Because you're only old as you feel. And these kids, just seeing them go hard after God, it means so much to me. So anyway, Pastor Curtis, he wanted me to take a break. Because there's a lot going on right now. The reason why is because I preached a sermon about three weeks ago. Which I think could have went better. But uh, it didn't. And I don't know if they really got anything out of it. Because I had in my mind an idea of what I wanted to talk about. But after showing my rough draft of my sermon to my sisters, they decided, yeah, you probably shouldn't share that. Because it cuts deep. A lot of it talked about my problems. And I even hinted on this quite a bit that night when I preached. One of my biggest issues is alcohol. Always has been, always will be. Uh, hence with the two OWIs and the things that we say, do, and think when we're drunk. Again, drunk words are sober thoughts. And I remember the day after my sermon, he wanted to talk. And we had met at a local coffee shop, talked. And... What he did is he reached out to me. I mean, he's a good kid, good dude. Honestly cares. And he's like, dude, this is your time to relax. This is your time to kind of recharge, refuel. And when you receive that, you let me know. The reason why I talked about that is because I feel like it's important for these kids to know how much I love them. How much that youth group means to me. And that I am willing to do anything for them. Including my own nieces and nephews. To help change their futures. And what I told them. Is. One night I went out drinking. I have way too much. 
I didn't tell them all the story. But I remember receiving a phone call from my sister. And I remember talking to my niece. And making fun of her. And like, that's, that's not who I am. And even though I was drunk, that's no excuse. But like I said, we often say, do and think things that we wouldn't normally do. When we're sober. So that encouraged me to seek help. Because I'm like, I need help. I can't afford to spend $3,000 for help. So I gotta do the next best thing. Go to A. So starting on day A, I earned my first chip on March 5th, which is my buddy Mike, uh, his birthday. So I'll remember that day very, very well. And my next Sunday, assuming I take this again one day at a time, I thank God for salvation. Thank Him for sobriety. I thank Him for everything. I'll get a red chip next week. And a lot of people have these mixed emotions about AA, what it is, what it feels like. And really, it's just a group of drunks that realize that they have a problem and they just need somebody to talk to about it. And there's this one guy's named Steve. And uh, every time he opens when he talks, especially toward the end of it, he always says, I'm tickled to be sober. Like, he, I st I'm starting to believe that for myself, too. Because, like, the longer that I stay sober, the more happier I become. Because I realize that I don't need to depend on alcohol to be happy. I have to depend on God. And one of the things that really makes me happy is working with that youth group. Now, I have to be honest with you. I have to do a better job at talking to them. About opening up with them. And I got to be careful what I say. Because I don't want to trigger them. Some of these kids are going through a really, really hard time. I haven't talked to them about it, but eventually I will. And one of the things that really hurt. As I was uh, worshiping this morning, is being reminded of the fact that two of our long stays, Ron and Karen, which have been in youth ministry for nearly 20 years, they decided to uh, step down. It wasn't anything that Pastor Curtis or his wife did, because if they did do something, it would have been easier for them. But they uh, were told. That they need to clear their schedule during prayer. And so it was really hard for them to make that choice. Because they love these kids. They've grown attached to these kids. They've been doing this for many, many years. Because they want to make sure that kids get set on the right path in life. And then they told me, when you're done with your encounter, which is like a prayer service, worship service, and she get a refuel or whatnot. We're going to need you. They're going to need you. Because they're stepping down. And I'm more than ready to be that leader. In fact, I want to be that leader. I want to be that person that these kids go to. When they need help. When they want somebody to talk to. Somebody that they can trust. I've already developed a friendship with one of them. And I love him and I love his family so, so much. His mom is an amazing woman of God. And Lord, I pray for them. But I just kind of wanted to share with that. Share what was on my heart. And I know that it was on my heart. And I know that it was from God because I could feel his touch. His touch is amazing. It wasn't a burning sensation, it was like a little tingling sensation that would start at my shoulder over here and work toward the center of my back. So that's God saying something, which is crazy. But as I'm reading through Luke 17, right, a few things pop out to me. So the first one that really popped out to me 
was when they started talking about the temptations to sin, which is what I tried to talk about uh, when I preached the other night. And it kind of goes from here. Where it says, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one though they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea, than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. So think, in terms of encounter, and why I'm doing that, is like, I don't want to cause these kids to stumble. I just don't. I want to encourage these kids to pursue God with all their heart. I want to encourage these kids to love others, to respect others. And I'm willing to go to the lengths of going to A, going to counseling, to show them that I want to be somebody that they could respect and look up to. So it ends with that. It says, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. So, rebuke. So, two things you should do. Brother is in terms of a person who has been saved. It could be your brother or your sister. Somebody that you know is a Christian and has been saved. And then it says, rebuke them. So, they did something out of line, out of question, and you know it was wrong, you know that they're saved. You call them out on it, but you do it in a loving, truthful way. For example, let's say I made a bad post, and I was being a jerk. Because I was calling somebody out in a non-Christian way. I was doing it to be funny, and one of my sisters... Not biological, but one of my uh, heavenly sisters. She knows who she is. She says, why, why do you feel the need to call him out? And I deleted the post. I was just being funny, but she made a good point about it. And I felt, I felt convicted, so that's why I deleted the post. People who love you and care about you will... Make you think twice about something. Okay. And then we go into talking about uh, repenting. So if they repent, repent means to uh, turn away. You need to forgive them. So if they stop, stop the action that you don't want them to do. And they're making changes to better their life. Forgive them. Because they're trying to be better people. Okay? And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns you seven times, saying, I repent, you must forgive him. So we had to know as humans, we had to know as sinners that it's just in our nature of sin. And as Christians, we know that we are sinners. We know that we have received the free gift of salvation. And we know that God's grace is sufficient. And we know that because we are children of God. Okay? And so we know that because we're sinners and all that, anybody who comes to us, whether they are a believer or not, they sin against us. We are called to forgive them. And if they repent and turn away, forgive them. I was talking about this in my counseling meeting the other day. A new counselor. And he, he made an interesting statement. Which is easier to do, to forgive or forget? It's a lot easier to forgive. And I think about that, and I think it's truthful. Which is easier to do? Forgive. 
But just because you forgive someone for something that they may have done or said, does it mean that you forget that? Does that mean that you should cut them out of your life? It depends. Are they toxic? Do they fill your cup? Or do they diminish it? If they diminish it, it's okay to cut ties with them. But if it's essential for them to be in your life, then I would just forgive and say, God, please not only help me forgive this person, please remove this anger inside of me that I don't want in my life. And another thing that my counselor had told me is to expect feelings of anger, feelings of bitterness, and all this. Because they're normal. But be mindful of what you say and do. And then, we go into what I believe is one of my Grandma Mary's favorite, favorite verses. Because it talks about faith. The Apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. Let's stop there. Like, how can God help you increase your faith? By basically telling you something that you should have already known. By performing miraculous signs and wonders. That's what they're expecting. Like, God, we lack in faith. Please give us more faith. Keep in mind, we're reading in the third gospel. Okay? And Jesus will literally die for them. I mean, if he doesn't die, he doesn't fall through on his promise. His promise is to save the world of their sins, from their sins. And these people are saying, we lack faith, please give us more. And so he goes on to say, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, some people say mountain. Again, it depends on the translation of the book that you're reading. But some people say mountain. Anyways, you could say to the small berry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea. And it would obey you. Or you could say to a mountain, move. And it would move. It talks about faith. And that's one thing that my grandma based a lot of her life on, is faith. And then we're going to talk about unworthy servants. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at a table? So keep in mind... Let's put this in terms that we can understand that right now. Let's say you're a manager of a grocery store, right? And your your clerks are working really hard for you. You got cashiers, sackers, you got stockers, you got meat cutters, you got bakery people, you got produce people, you got people working their butts off. And wouldn't it be easier for, let's just say, me as a manager, if I ever were, to just invite them to the back and just treat them. Treat them to food, treat them to whatever they want. Wouldn't it be easier? It would totally be easier. And they'd probably be more appreciative of doing things for you instead of you demanding things. And delegating things the entire time. Wouldn't that be easier? It totally would. But it goes on to say, Will he not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me, and dress properly. Serve me while I eat or drink. After you will eat and drink. So again, putting this in terms that we can understand or that I can understand. So instead of taking care of your people and treating them with respect, right? Let's say you're constantly demanding things of them, 
constantly delegating tasks that you could do yourself to them, and you're not doing anything. You're literally just sitting on your butt, just giving people orders. You think people are going to respect you? Probably not. It would be easier for us to thank them for what they do and to treat them well and to take care of them. I think that's what God is saying. It's easier to love people and take care of people and show people that you care versus just demanding more from them. Anyways, it goes on to you. Say, does he thank the servant because he did what you commanded? So that when you also have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. So again, I'm unworthy of God's love. I thank him each and every day for his love. And I'm in a season right now where I don't know what to expect. But I know God is moving in, in me and through me. And if it weren't for making these positive changes in my life, I wouldn't recognize that. I know that you guys are loved, you're appreciated, and I care for you deeply. If you need anything, shoot me a message. Give you my phone number, we could talk. I'm here for you. I love you. I care about you. And I hope you have a most blessed day. Good night. God bless.